I'm very glad to be able to give you a, a warm welcome to Parliament Buildings today uh, to our Assembly, Queen's, Ulster University and Open University Knowledge Exchange seminar in relation to how we deliver more for less. Uh, before I begin, can I just take an opportunity to say thank you to all of the partners who are involved with delivering the Knowledge Exchange seminar series. I've attended a, a number of the, the series myself. Unfortunately, I can't stay today due to OFM, DFM uh, committee commitments, but um, I think they've been really valuable. Uh, the last one I attended was in relation to uh, peacemaking in Northern Ireland and, and dealing with uh, interfaces uh, here in our community. Uh, and I must say that the evidence that was brought to bear on that occasion was extremely helpful. Indeed, I think it exposed even the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom as needing to do a wee bit more work on his evidence basis for some of the, the points that he had been making. So I, I'm really grateful for all the work uh, that goes into delivering the series. Uh, a particular mention to the Assembly Research and Information Services. They do some fantastic work. Uh, I think MLAs could probably avail of the service even more to fuse even better evidence into the contributions that we make in the Assembly Chamber. You, may all agree with that <laughs> intensely, but we're, we're on a journey and it's thanks to the, the RAISE services that we are able to help improve the, the policy making decisions that we make here at the Assembly and with the Executive. Can I, th I thank everyone who's attended today as well. We have representation from across our government departments, across further education, higher education, uh, and NGOs as well have the Centre for Effective Services, YWAM, some of our local councils, Strategic Investment Board, uh, NEVE, uh, and as I say, our, our government departments as well. So really grateful for the, the turnout today. Hopefully it's going to make for a, a lively discussion after our presentations. I think this is a particularly timely uh, seminar given the significant public service reform that we're experiencing uh, and in a time of particularly challenging budgetary reductions and, and cuts. There's a real need for us to make better use of evidence in public policy making and public services decision making. And it's going to be absolutely vital uh, to do this well, that we have good evidence in order to achieve better outcomes for people in our community. Public service reform has to be taken extremely seriously uh, by all MLAs, particularly given the need for us to do more with less. The Assembly and the Executive face a period of significant reform and restructuring. We have the proposed reduction in the number of MLAs from 108 to 90, and the restructuring of the Executive from 12 departments into nine. Uh, the new departments will be in place following the May 2016 election, with the reduction in MLAs scheduled for 2021. With my MLA rather than my Deputy Chair hat on, I was willing to support that happening sooner, but we're scheduled for 2021. Um, and the legislation to give effect to these changes will be passing through the Assembly shortly. Indeed, the committee for OFM DFM is dealing with the department's bill as we speak via accelerated passage. Uh, and then there will be a what they call a transfer of functions uh, to come before us, which will look in more detail as to what exact, what exact functions will cross across those particular departments, which I think is going to be extremely important because there are some big changes ahead, perhaps most notably in relation to children and young people, which at present sits with OFM, DFM, uh, but is proposed, for example, the children's strategy and the child care strategy to go to the Department of Education. So I think there are some important and interesting debates to ensure that those functions transfer appropriately. We do have previously undertaken work by the Assembly on the issue of restructuring government to which we can refer when legislating on these matters. For example, the Assembly and Executive Review Committee agreed a number of principles that should underpin any restructuring of the Northern Ireland departments. Among these very interestingly worded principles were non-overlap, which is to say that no two departments or their agencies should have the same authority to act in the same circumstance. Span of control, these are some very groovy uh, terminologies, I have to say. Span of control, which is involving grouping of functions in manageable organisational sizes and tailoring the workload to the capacity of the minister and their chief officials. You can get into what that means uh, today. Uh, customer facing, that services should be grouped 
and organised with the intention of providing a better service to the public. That sounds like an extremely important one to me. So reorganisation of government in Northern Ireland is taking place also in light of the autumn statement delivered by the Chancellor. And although George Osborne highlighted the additional spending power for the Northern Ireland Executive to support implementation of Stormont House Agreement, devolution of corporation tax, he has also made it clear that the onus will be on the Executive to play its part in delivering sustainable budgets. So throughout this period of significant change, the Assembly will of course have a key role to play in terms of oversight and accountability and ensuring that any reform of public services is undertaken with the interests of the public at the forefront. Essential to good public service reform will be absolutely making better use of evidence in policy making and law making and when budget setting. Uh, our assembly committees uh, are often confronted with significant amounts of evidence from stakeholders and there's a need for us to be able to effectively weigh up the merits of this evidence uh, with what is political and what is practically achievable. So effective knowledge exchange is going to be absolutely vital in the times ahead. I'm delighted, therefore, uh, that to help us gain a better understanding uh, on all these issues, we have this series and this event today. Uh, and our first presentation is by Dr. McCarthy from the School of Politics, International Studies and Philosophy at Queen's University, Belfast. Dr. McCarthy is going to look at the issue of public service reform in a time of cutbacks. And secondly, we have Professor Sally Shortall, also from Queen's University, Belfast, who will be leading the session on making better use of evidence in public policy making. Sally is also joined by Jonathan uh, Bricken and Peter O'Neill from the Alliance for Useful Evidence. And you're all very, very welcome here today. Uh, I'm very grateful that everyone has given up their time to consider how we can work together uh, to respond on these important issues. Uh, and I, I wish you a really constructive session today. Thank you. Uh, so I, when I, I propose this topic, it, it relates to some research I'm doing at the moment on collaboration in, in government uh, between public <laughs> organisations. And I suppose the, the, the particular relevance today is to the issue of what, what, what's going on and, and what the role of Parliament is in all of this. And mm. uh, hopefully there'll be some food for thought for, for people here uh, in respect to this mm. issue of um, yeah, how, how there's these organisational reforms going on in governments internationally what parliaments need to maybe be watching out for uh, in the context of this, because all reforms have uh, consequences and have costs uh, attached to them. So what I propose to do is to uh, talk a little bit about the, the wider uh, budgetary context for all this, which will hopefully be quite familiar to you, um, to talk a little bit about some of these new modes of public service organisation I'm, I'm um, doing the research on, uh, the challenges arising from these, uh, and, as I say, the role of, of Parliament uh, in this context as well, and maybe draw some tentative conclusions, which you might, um, we might discuss then uh, afterwards. And indeed, hopefully it will feed nicely into my colleague uh, Sally's uh, presentation with, with Jonathan and um, with Peter as well. Okay, so um, this... Uh, I mean, this look. This is just from uh, Eurostat uh, data here. I just, I just, just took the couple of countries that are have, have received uh, loan programs uh, to to fund their public services, sandwiched by two countries that have not. Um, so, you know, the the Irish case. I'm sure you'd be fairly familiar to you there. The the massive outlier there in 2010, uh, arising from the recapitalisation of the banks, which was put onto the national budget. Um, but thereafter, things getting back um, under control, and indeed the figures today suggesting things are even doing better than, than was anticipated in terms of reducing the, the annual debt to within the EU fiscal rules. Um, but similarly, within other states as well, you've had to have these massive adjustments, really, really extraordinary period of fiscal retrenchment across, um, certainly across the Eurozone. Uh, not so bad. Things have been pretty okay in Germany uh, during the recession. Thank you very much. Unemployment's actually dropped uh, over the last couple of years rather than, than increasing. Um, and then, obviously, outside the Eurozone, then in, in the United Kingdom, um, you still have a not insubstantial uh, debt uh, and deficit to be breached, hence the ongoing uh, cuts. So there is, as we know, this, this budgetary pressure for retrenchment. And one of the big ingredients as to how this gap is to be bridged is of course the cost of, of running the state, as it were. And within that, governments have decided, well, a very important thing to do is to discover or unleash new efficiencies from around the administrative systems. 
And this has thrown up all sorts of very interesting developments that in many ways, okay, some of it repeats what went before, but in many ways there's a lot of new things happening uh, in, in, in administrative systems within bureaucracies. Uh, and those of you who work within the public service here, I imagine some of you do, hopefully this will be um, familiar to, to um, your experience at the moment. Okay, so uh, this is from um, a survey. This is the EUPAN, the European Union Public Administration Network, from 2013, so, so two years ago, um, a survey of officials and the question here was, uh, how important is, is reform of the administrative system in terms of institutional reform, changing organisations around? Uh, and a large number there were saying, uh, yeah, I think we have a majority here, top government priority for you know, 20%, another 30% saying it's one of a few top priorities. So it is being very, very uh, clearly a prominent development in terms of uh, government strategies for addressing their, their fiscal deficits has to be, to be institutionally reformed, their administrative systems, uh, as I say. Again, uh, a separate survey organised by an academic network uh, reporting in 2013, again, uh, identified this issue of new methods of collaboration and cooperation amongst different public sector actors. So organisations beginning to talk to each other and saying, look, we both have to achieve savings of 5%, 10%, 20%. How can we work together to do this? And the key issue here is because they can't do it in many cases in isolation. Organisations are not achieving their targets on their own and they have to look around uh, in order to, to, to do that. So this issue of collaboration and cooperation between public organisations uh, is the, the primary focus of research for me. Um, some of the ways this has happened has been through uh, mergers, okay? That's a fairly blunt instrument. We have too many organisations, let's merge them. We have 100 organisations, let's, let's have 80. There's bound to, be, bound to be savings. And that has been a, an, an early strategy of many, many governments, has been to just, let's get rid of a few quangos. By and large, in fact, I don't, I'm not aware of a single case where the, the savings targets are achieved. Um, there are many cases where there have been significant cost overruns, in fact, um, rather than, than, than the savings. And in many cases, the, um, the proposed uh, mergers uh, have, have just been, been abandoned and, and created new, new difficulties. They have worked, sorry, I don't want to be too, too negative, sorry, I'm just thinking there, the UK figures, there have been some, some very um, significant savings, um, but there's been retreats in lots of areas from the initial ambitions of, in terms of targets of no, let's close numbers of organisations and, and merge organisations and, and so on. Uh, yeah, actually, sorry, I forgot this slide was here, there's, there's proof for that. Um, so this is what's happened, uh, this is figures from the Cabinet Office uh, in terms of the initial plans, uh, and we can see... Um, yeah, so you've, you've you know, 92 organisations abolished. Now, I would say to you, something like 65% of these organisations had zero spend. You're talking about small advisory bodies that really had a very sort of fluid existence anyway. So by closing them down, you're not actually making any major, you're not putting a big dent in your, in your public debt, as it were. Um, but there have been a lot of absorptions, uh, agencies going back into their parent departments. Um, you can think, for example, of the recent case here of the, um, the Health and Social Care Trust was not a, you know, you know, absorbed back into the Department of, of Health, as it were. Um, other things going on there include um, alternatives, yeah, functions being switched to alternative bodies and, and so on. There have, in fact, been, what's interesting is that, while well, there's been a lot of tinkering around in terms of the numbers of organisations, by and large, a lot of functions are still being performed. They're just being performed by different organisations. So you have a lot of what's called bureau shuffling, moving things around. Okay, you're not necessarily losing. The state isn't doing dramatically less. It's just trying to do it in new ways, okay, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But as I say, it, is, it has consequences. Um, in terms of um, collaboration within public government, uh, within public governance, I mean, there's a very large literature within the private sector, as you won't be surprised to hear about, how private sector organisations collaborate um, to maximise profits, to maximise shareholder value, and, and so on. Uh, it's obviously more difficult when you get into the public sector because the metrics aren't as immediately obvious. You know, how do we how do we know we're doing better by collaborating with another organisation? Uh, in in some areas, uh, it's just not going to be possible to to put a, a, a clear um, evidence based uh, metric beside that. Um, so within organisations, I mean, much of the early literature from the private sector was about how. Um, in organisations when times are tight, you know, you look for efficiencies internally and you try to align processes and you try to align uh, or move people around and so on. Um, that broadened out to 
how organizations collaborate with other organizations to, to achieve what in the literature, famous book by Huxham and McDonald's talked about collaborative advantage, one, two or more organizations working together to achieve in a market advantage that their rivals do not have. Okay? And the point of this is, again, as I say, it's that an advantage that no individual organization could achieve on its own. Okay? So it's this logic that is somehow being, being transferred into the public sector uh, but maybe won't have the, necessarily the same success. Um, and again, just a, a definition here. This is related to research I'm doing at the moment. Uh, this is probably the best known um, definition of collaborative public management. Facilitating, operating, and multi-organization arrangements to solve problems that cannot be solved or solved easily by, by single organizations. So you can see this is very germane to the ongoing discussion in the context of austerity. How do public organizations do, not necessarily more for less, as the, the chairman mentioned, but maintain service levels? given budgetary cutbacks, or indeed achieve, or just do less with less, which has had to be the case in, in some cases as well. Okay, how this has actually happened, I've mentioned some of it already, uh, there've been a variety of, of strategies adopted by government. First and foremost, you have just the very plain and this very strong evidence from this going back to the 1970s when you had similar experiences of, you know, on the back of the oil crisis governments retreating or retrenching, um, just, just pure centralization. Things are centralized, controls. So there was a big push from the 1980s to devolve autonomy and financial controls out to, you know, down, down the lines, down the grades and public services, out to agencies and so on. But we've seen a very sharp reversal of this process over the last six, seven years arising from the global financial crisis. So just pure centralization of authority and of decision-making decision capacity in, in civil services. Um, Lots of closures uh, of organizations, often a lot of strategic behavior by the agencies as well, um, presenting themselves as invaluable to the future of the state and you know, actively working against government plans to, to close them down. Mergers, I've, I've mentioned um, as well, so that's not just at the national level, I mean local authority level, cases here in Northern Ireland of course, gone from 26 to 11. Um, municipal um, mergers has been rampant uh, around the developing world uh, in recent years. Um, closures and mergers, um, new forms of collaboration, and some of these would be familiar to you. Shared services is enormously popular. Shared services have popped up everywhere. It's already, I know, in place for a good few years here in Enterprise Shared Services in, in Northern Ireland. It's, in some respects, it's similar to the old, what used to be called common services. Um, the idea here is, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but it's the idea of consolidating what are sort of conventionally known as um, back office corporate functions, HR, IT, payroll, pensions. Um, we have 10 organizations, they all have a HR office, an IT office, and so on. Let's just have one, okay? So the idea of a shared service is, is the single provision of a service to multiple organizations. And it is, and it, there's no doubt there are absolutely efficiencies um, to be made on this. And there are some very good cases. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the, the Irish ones, uh, in particular the um, HR shared service called PeoplePoint, just won a big award um, on shared services awards or whatever, whatever the, what it was for. Uh, a lot of it is to do with very careful basing. There's been some extraordinary um, disasters on shared services international, internationally, particularly in um, Australia, massive cost overruns. There have been some very good examples. Enterprise shared services here seems to be quite a good example of, of you know, well-managed. Um, there is a certain element of, um, you know, you must always be sceptical as a, as a researcher in this when something is, is just too good, too good to be true. The logic of shared services is just like, yeah, let's just keep, keep just throwing things into the one unit and it's all transactional, you know, it's no-brainers, just, just, just keep increasing the scale, as it were. Um, but I think you need to be very careful about this. There are some functions and particularly in the case of uh, IT, where you know, if there's a failure, it, it's a huge, huge problem, not just to one organization, but to money, okay? You, you literally have to you know, shut the business down and go home because you can't, can't do anything. So shared services is very popular internationally at the moment as a form of, of collaboration. Um, and what's interesting is that it's moving from not just transaction services, but into areas like, for example, provision of legal advice. Um, so government departments, hypothetically, will you know, all have a legal unit and they consolidate that into one legal unit, but, but again, you're into uh, certain difficulties there. Um, other issues like uh, policy expertise, you can, the uh, centralization of policy expertise is uh, particularly interesting. Um, 
the governance of shared services is also, well, that's another issue about is a shared service just, are you just consolidating things? In, in other words, it's just centralization, or is it really shared services in the, in the way that the new shared service organization co-governs along with the, uh, the vendee? So the shared services is the vendor offering the service, and the vendee is the, the old organization that used to have the HR division within it and so on. Is there a co-governance, or is it like, sorry, this is the only service you can have, and if you want anything else, tough, you're, you're, you're not getting it. So problems arise in that respect. Uh, digital consolidation, okay, so this is the, the move towards common IT platforms and public services. Um, so they, this is like, you know, nearly a generation old at this stage, this idea of moving towards greater digitization of public services, okay? So the non-face-to-face -face, um, interaction uh, of the public with government, but, but instead the emphasis on, um, yeah, you know, online online services. Um, so this is, again has been there's been a lot of cost savings and a lot of uh, appeal of this idea of well you know our, our IT budget is, is quite high can we can we can we you know make some efficiency savings by joining up with other organisations to have for example a, a single web portal okay so NI Direct or something like this can we can we make savings by just uh, virtually uh, um, consolidating consolidating things as well. So there might necessarily be an organisational change associated with that. You're just doing it for virtual sort of the, the interface. Um, joint activities. So organisations that, for example, license things, um, that regulate things, that inspect things. Um, I was reading about a case in New Zealand where they, the local authorities share um, um, what is it, like, uh, helicopter flights. Where I can't remember what they do it for, but anyway, they, or no, it must be Australia. Sorry, yeah, wherever they're surveying mass areas, so they, you know, they share helicopters or whatever. Uh, so joint joint activities uh, of various sorts. So there's been a huge amount of innovation. I mean, this is the story you never hear about. Public service has been very innovative, coming up ways um, to save money by trying to collaborate. You see, it's it's fairly well. It's not unusual at local authority level. Because, of course, local authorities are delivering the same services, just in different territorial areas. But at the national level, where you have organisations that do fairly different things now collaborating, it's a very, very interesting development in terms of how we understand what it is government does and how we account for that uh, financially and so on. Uh, and finally, there are intermunicipal companies. Again, it's, we, don't, we don't have so much of this. Um, it's not really a, in Britain and Ireland. These wouldn't be very common. Although, well, there's some appearing in, in um, England, certainly. But... Um, Germany, Austria, these are huge. This is a big deal, the, the uh, creation of companies by uh, local authorities joining together, um, like, you know, effectively profit-making companies performing um, public, public services. So there's lots going on. The crisis has just formed, has kind of um, stimulated this huge amount of uh, new ways of thinking about how public services are delivered and how public organisations organise themselves. So in terms of parliament, now there are lots of consequences of all that about for public management and theoretically, how we understand the role of government in the sense of the public service. But I just wanted to put out a few thoughts here in respect of Parliament. What does this mean for Parliament? Because, of course, the, big, the theory is that you have a, a, a legislature which is overseeing the executive arm of government, you know, the civil service, the agencies, local authorities. All of this, all of their work ultimately is meant to feed back through the, the parliamentary scrutiny system, isn't it? You know, Parliament's been able to tell us how's money been spent, what's going on. Um, we we want to hold you to account. Well, first of all, when you get into this world of collaboration and you get into this world of things like shared services and, um, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned procurement. Procurement has been huge, joint procurement, uh, new national procurement offices and so on. When you get into this world where organisations are sharing functions and sharing parts of their budgets with other organisations to perform old things in new ways or brand new things, this creates difficulties for your average parliamentarian and understanding uh, who, who perhaps is used to a very, very singular vote or silo-led, you know, here's the Department of X and there's its budget. What did it get for the budget? And you're saying, well, okay, but about 20% of that budget is actually shared with another organisation. And you say, well, well, who's accountable for the overspend or the underspend? Uh, and again, I would say there are, there are some spectacular failures in some of these collaborations um, internationally. And one of the big things come out of it was you know, nobody was, was held to account, nobody saw it coming, the budgets were just too confused across organisational lines. Um, so there wasn't a clear line of sight on the scrutiny, um, in the scrutiny task of, of Parliament to, to foresee this or to do anything about it, in fact, when, when it happened. Um, because there are, yeah, there are, in a lot of these um, issues, what's always underestimated, and I think it's very relevant to 
what the chairman said there about the proposed um, consolidation of, of uh, devolved departments here, that you know, there's always, always costs that people don't anticipate and such thing. It's never cost neutral. Um, I could be proved wrong, I've never heard of savings being made by government reorganisation uh, in the you know, pounds, shilling and pence. Um, you know, from simple things like new brass plates right across to costs of new buildings and, and so on as well. Um, the, okay, so this is the, the, the fairly straightforward issue which you'll, you'll get of um, how Parliament holds these cross-organisational functions uh, to account. Does the performance, how do you know they're doing well? Uh, shared services, um, you know, from what you hear, in many cases people are happy with them, it speeds up processes, you know, it, it, it divests organisations of a lot of that back office stuff, you know, so they can get on with what they're, they're meant to be doing. Um, and that's all fine. How do you know when your shared service centre, I'm just picking that, uh, or your new procurement centre is doing well? You know, what's your metric? What do you compare it with? How do you know they're not underperforming? How do you know they're not actually turning out to be way more expensive? They, yeah, they seem to be performing, but how do you know that an alternative arrangement was not going to be cheaper than this new centralised body that, you, that you've created? So again, these are just hypothetical questions, but they're, they do have a practical, a real world um, uh, you know, question a, a attached to them. Um, also, when you create these new organisations or when you do these organisational reforms, is there ever any talk about, um, or, or, you know, what's, is there merit in reviewing them of having some sort of a one-year or two-year review after the event has happened say, well, look, what has, can we demonstrate savings here? Can we demonstrate that this new way of performing a function, like delivering um, IT services across the civil service from a single organisation, you know, this has been a, a complete runaway success. You know, you know, we need a review to to assess that and have a look at it. Uh, and finally, then there's there's the issue. Well, it relates to the first one, of course, of um, the budgets for this. You know, how do you how do you account financially uh, for this as well as well as the sort of service quality and the uh, the political dimension of it? How do you account for the the money that's being spent in the time of uh, when you know it all counts? Uh, and this is where it feeds into the wider issue. Sorry of the. the this you know, general international move towards greater budgetary transparency. And I've just taken this slide from a um, new OECD, well, a presentation by a guy from the OECD. Um, I read a lot of work the OECD, OECD are doing, encouraging governments to open up their budgetary uh, process. And this is going beyond just you know, televising parliamentary debates and you know, the, the finance bill or whatever. Um, so traditionally, you know, there was pub, you know, this idea of parliamentary authorization of the budgetary process is a kind of a litmus test of a democratic system, you know, there's your revenues, here's your money coming in, here's your expenditure, there's extant liabilities there and, you know, people have a sense of what, what position the state is in. Um, accountability to the citizens for this and to, to Parliament, obviously. Um, for what, you know, some notion of the public interest, you know, it's a, a task of government every year to, to, to successfully steer a budget through government. There's a big element of trust here, you know, that people aren't going to be... Um, giving unfair advantage to particular social interests or particular vested interests or, or whatever. But what's interesting is that in recent years, there's been huge strides towards opening up the budgetary process much more broadly and thinking about a much wider range of actors in all of this. And it does relate, I think, to this, what I'm saying about these new forms of collaboration between organisations and so on and how you understand how public money is being, being spent. So there's a much greater emphasis on process, how you know, money is spent, how it is accounted for, I'm sure you've heard of performance budgeting, okay, having a much clearer link between money being spent and tasks being achieved or, or not achieved. Um, plans, multi-annual plans, so trying with incredible difficulty to move away from the year-on-year -year concern but towards a multi-annual concerns. Uh, performance, I just mentioned. Um, risks, trying to be more upfront to say, well, here are the risks, you know, if, you know, if there's a Brexit or if the EU collapses or whatever, um, here, here are the liabilities that, 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 might, uh, that might accrue. Um, in terms of accountability, you know, national, particularly somewhere like the Eurozone, where, you know, government budgets, you know, have knock-on effects on each other now, that you're, you're accountable to a wider set of actors now than just, you know, your polity, you know, your, your government and your, your citizens. Those international bond markets have sort of <laughs> appeared of, to be of tremendous importance in the success and failure of nature, nations in recent years. Um, various international bodies, the IMF and so on want to know about budgetary uh, content and processes as well. Um, and then for what? Well, there's for, for participation, you know. Um, the OECD is very keen on encouraging uh, your non-traditional actors, so civil society organisations, um, 
other interests of, of having a say in the budgetary process and, and having, a, uh, having mechanisms in place to allow people to, to voice their opinions about how public money is being spent or intended to be spent. Um, lowering costs, um, yeah, having greater integrity in the process, greater public trust by virtue of, of transparency, um, better decision making and ultimately, I suppose, better, um, better impacts. So that's the, the issue of uh, budgetary transparency which relates to that.